uh, working with habitual patterns is an idea that has germinated with me after studying Buddhism for uh, about 10 years. Habitual patterns mean something different in Western psychology than they do in Buddhist psychology. And the difference is sort of what's called a reframe on something that we take for granted and you hear over and over again, it means almost nothing. But then in a new context, it all of a sudden means a lot. And that's what's happened to me with habitual patterns. They are essentially all of our enculturation, all of our socialization, and to really understand it requires a great deal of effort and time and energy. So this is a quick thumbnail. These are some of the things I wanted to cover. CBT, it means Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. The other headings we will, we will cover as we get there. This is a little diagram that explains how Cognitive Behavioral Therapy works. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy uh, works with feelings, thoughts, and uh, behavior. The arrows are going clockwise and counterclockwise because they, they denote that a change in any of the areas will affect change in the other areas. It doesn't matter exactly where there's an intervention to try and, and help someone. If you can change feelings, that will change behavior ostensibly, and vice versa if you change thoughts about the feelings, the same uh, theory holds. So uh, cognitive behavioral therapy appeals to me because, because of my training. Uh, initially in, in college, I had a class on theories and techniques where we had to apply uh, 15 different theories in a peer counseling setting. So learning the theory and answering questions, then we apply them to real people. Um, the next uh, experience I had that was germane to this was uh, family therapy, which views all families as systems of communication, systems of emotion, systems and systems and systems. And this is all about systems of behavior, patterns of behavior. So it appeals to me. This is the current um, APA DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's about a thousand pages. They um, categorize almost everything that uh, an insurance company will pay for. And to me, that's what it's for primarily. Um, labeling somebody and giving them a number doesn't necessarily help. It just does that. It just gives them a number or a label. And what I found from my previous experiences and training is we're all bozos on this bus. Everybody in here would be on a continuum and fall in the DSM-5 in some way, shape, or form. Um, not so much as an extreme, perhaps, but somewhere on the continuum. To me, it's better uh, and more uh, useful to view us all that way rather than people that need help are, are some fringe group. That's not the case. This is another example of, I just pulled this out of a DSM-5 book that also has the ICD-10 codes in a different color. This is just a small sample of all the things that are in the, the DSM-5. What's in a name? Said William Shakespeare. Actually, it was he wrote that, he didn't say it. And that's, that's the point of, of the DSM-5 gives names to people that are actually misapplied, I think, in many ways. And people come in and talk to me sometimes and say, I'm bipolar or um, I'm phobic or whatever it is. And that's really not who they are. That's an experience they have. And that's how I'd prefer to view it rather than them being something. The other part of this is that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. It's kind of a reminder to get back into our experience rather than react to labels and names as if they're real. That's a societal problem right now, I think. So here's some patterns. This is kind of a joke pattern. Plaid, 
Here's another pattern came from my past. Paisley was very popular in the 70s. And here's some more patterns. Um, I named this one Westphalia Plaid. I used to have a VW camper that had upholstery that matched very closely. These are multiple dimensions of experience. I learned these uh, from a psychologist in San Diego named Michael Yapko. And he is an Ericksonian hyp hypnotist. Physiological, cognitive, behavioral, affective, relational, symbolic, contextual, historical. They're all uh, variables to understand people under and to learn more about how and why we function the way we do. I think they're far more descriptive than a number or a label. And they're far more helpful because you can, I can, or anyone can understand more about what's going on than with a name or a label. The first thing I'd like to point out about this is, is the, uh, the style of, uh, it's a range or a scale, a continuum for each one of these variables listed. And that corresponds to my view that we are all on a continuum in the DSM-5. These are all on a continuum as well. In Buddhism, it's also called the middle way. So it rather defines what the cure is, which is finding the middle way of these, in, in many cases, in most cases, of these uh, various variables and continuum. This is uh, just a repeat of what I was saying, we're all on this bell curve someplace. And um, the idea of a scale is really useful in CBT because anyone having an emotional event can rate it if you get really angry. Is that a 10 out of 10? Is that a 5 or a 4? And it helps to learn to moderate an emotional experience after it occurs. So here we are back to the, my list. The observing self is down in small letters. It's another CBT uh, tool. It means the ability that we have to observe and be conscious of what occurs inside of us as well as what occurs outside in our relationships and in our, in our interaction. The, um, the observing self is key to learn meditation and it's key to understand uh, process. Process is what happens over time, from one step to another, uh, how we relate to people, what happened that caused that emotional reaction. The observing self is crucial to figure that out for yourself. And then the other small heading there, mindful breathing, is another beginning step in, in meditation. Most meditation techniques, not all, but a lot of them, use breathing as an object to pay attention to. And it's not really an object, it's constantly recurring. But the idea is to view your breath and be conscious of your breath, no matter what you're doing, and that is a variety of meditation. Um, you can count the breaths and see if you can get to 10, uh, before, uh, before you lose track, because what happens in most all meditation is your, your brain, your mind, your consciousness uh, notices other thoughts, other feelings, you get distracted, a noise, whatever. And if you're concentrating on your breathing, you can come back to that. And that, that becomes a focal point to uh, increase your concentration, increase relaxation, another, uh, a number of really good uh, uses. This is, now I'm going to talk about, I guess up here it was uh, truth or consequences. Uh, truth or consequences is a, is a, does anybody remember the radio show? <laughs> I, I just remember the name. Um, anyway, I liked it, and it's also a town in New Mexico. So the truth is, developmental psychology has taught that all humans and actually, I believe all mammals, go through phases of development and stages of development. Um, the earliest stage is attachment to the mother. 
Um, in the 60s, John Bowlby uh, formed theories of attachment, which have been foundational in helping therapists and psychotherapists understand our variations in, in personality and character as we grow up. Uh, the, this is from the Harlow monkey studies in the 50s, where they removed uh, infant monkeys from their mothers. And wow, shocking. They became agitated, disturbed. And this, uh, this image shows the monkey preferring this cloth surrogate mother to another wire mother that had food. Uh, so this self-soothing self behavior uh, was continuous, and it, I think it's also valid for humans. So we all go through the similar stages. Um, most people go off to school and, and have encounters with other kids their age. Those create uh, understandings of who they are and teach how to relate and become socialized in our world. Uh, then they grow through school. Um, graduation becomes a very common ritual experience of moving into the adulthood phase of life. And uh, same thing, everybody experiences this differently and has a different experience going through this, which helps create and form the habitual patterns that make us up. Rituals of adulthood continue the same, uh, you know, similarly um, to show that you're successful and feel like you're accomplished as a professional or an adult uh, worker in our, in our culture. Marriage, family. And this is a, um, a symbol from uh, Tibetan Buddhism that uh, I'm using it here as a, an image depicting Carl Jung's theory of collective unconscious, which is really the sum total of all possibilities for human beings. All possible permutations of us are the collective unconscious, and what will we become? This mandala is about um, compassion. The Chinrezi is the deity of compassion in Tibetan Buddhism. And this is the mandala uh, designed for that. It was probably uh, brushed away shortly after this picture was taken, demonstrating all life is impermanent. This is a fractal image. I really like fractals. Um, within this image is uh, an infinite variety, and yet it still has it can still be identified as a fractal. This is a very close-up view of a fractal. Uh, they are never, they are ever changing. The, the fractals cannot be ended. The formula that creates these has developed an infinite possibility of shapes, and yet they're all identifiable as fractals. Here's a macro view. We were looking at the micro view before. This is similar to, to me, this is similar, not the same, but similar to um, what happens to, to us in our families. Um, people that I meet individually are a product of a family and they also have those similarities with their families. It's not as obvious as this, but here's a, a fractal applied in real life. Romanescu broccoli. You can see that every single nodule, every single bud reflects the whole and vice versa. So here, the, here is the, okay, so this is the questionnaire that um, is the original questionnaire for the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. It originated with Kaiser Permanente and um, the, a research director there was uh, running a program on weight loss and found that half of the people kept dropping out. He wondered why. Why do half of the people drop out of this study? They were losing weight. It was a successful program. 
And so he started giving some questions and doing personal interviews and found that almost universally they were the products of abusive family backgrounds. So it turns out that the eating behaviors and their weight gain were similar self-soothing behaviors as the rhesus monkeys. This questionnaire was developed by the guy along with the CDC, Center for Disease Control, and the results are absolutely profound. If so many people have taken this, how many, how many have had like two or more on this? It's very common, three or two thirds of the public have experiences like this. And I'll show you just, uh, the research is, is quite profound. This is the pyramid that demonstrates what they postulate happens. Um, traumatic events in childhood then create social emotional impairment, um, which also contributes to high risk behaviors, health risk behaviors. Um, that, that then contribute to disease, disability, and social problems, and early death. They found that uh, people were actually dying 20 years early that had uh, untreated traumatic experiences in childhood. So here are some of the other predictions. An ACE score of four, uh, you're twice as likely to be smoker and seven times more likely to be alcoholic. If alcoholism is the pattern, those folks really need to look at their childhood experiences uh, along with quitting drinking in order to resolve the underlying issues. Uh, the, the other uh, things listed are quite profound. 400% um, increase of chronic bronchitis and emphysema, 1,200 percent uh, with suicide attempts. A score of six is associated with 30-fold increase in attempted suicide, 3,000 percent. That's enormous. Um, immune system is impacted, depression. The, the last line is, is really important. The study shows that most of our major chronic health, mental health, economic health, and social health issues are related to early childhood trauma. Seems like we ought to do something about that. Here's more correlations. Uh, as you can see, teen pregnancy is 40% more likely for kids from that background. I'm going to try and go through these fast now. Um, Depression, this is 50 years later, uh, is close to 60% for um, women with a score of four or greater. Here's a similar one on depression. This is the uh, antidepressant prescriptions for four and five. It's almost 100%. That, to me, that's astounding. And here's one that I think deserves some longer discussion. But they found that if, if uh, kids had a score of four, four yeses out of 10, that they were 30 plus percent more likely to be raped. How does that happen? So here's one of the explanations for this. Um, this is a simple model of, of the brain. Um, these are the areas involved in emotional regulation. The, Amygdala is, is part of, it's also called the reptilian brain. It's connected to the brain stem. That's where we have uh, our genetic responses, our survival responses, fight, flight reactions. Uh, the hippocampus is a small part that stems around the amygdala. And uh, the prefrontal cortex is what's found to be most useful in emotional management. So, all the statistics that I just got done citing indicate that kids that grow up in traumatic homes, due to the constant arousal from the amygdala that triggers uh, 
adrenaline, the adrenal glands release adrenaline, and cortisol. So their bodies are constantly flooded with these biochemicals, and they do not learn the skills to moderate emotion. There's no gradation. There's no continuum. It's like all or nothing. A trigger produces a full-on rush of adrenaline and cortisol. And so there's no, they, they haven't developed the ability to moderate and to manage their emotions like, in quotes, normal people. So that is a huge, that's a huge development. And again, it seems to me that we need to do something. And this is the possibility that I found that is most promising coming out of the Mind and Life conferences. This, is, this picture is taken from the, the 33rd conference. I was only aware of about 10, and they're still ongoing. The website is there. The information on the website is free and available. There's all kinds of videos. and This is some of the topics they covered. Number three was emotions and health. Number six, the new physics and cosmology. It's not limited just to behavioral sciences. And the Dalai Lama asked some really uh, eye-opening questions. It seems to me that the uh, cross-cultural influence is very, very favorable for us. Uh, out of those conferences came some meditation research uh, this is the EEG studies, and um, Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin in Madison brought professional meditators, also known as uh, Tibetan Lamas, to uh, Wisconsin, hooked them up to these gadgets, and measured their brain waves. He also measured their uh, functional MRI scans, and again, the results are profound. The idea of neuroplasticity was discovered. That means the brain is pliable and changes with experience. Until this time, everyone in our culture was raised with the belief that when our brain and brain cells died, that was it. There was no regeneration of neurons, and they've shown that to be false, that we can have new developments in our brain and do. So through uh, experience, musicians end up having large audio centers that are developed and actually larger. Meditators have large, larger areas of hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, and the areas that are consistent with uh, positive emotion. The, um, they discovered what areas produce positive emotions, which is, to me, amazing. That was the promise early on in psychology, and it's being done. We're also capable of producing and sustaining positive emotions, capable of managing and reducing destructive emotions. Those correlates go hand in hand. This one is another quite profound one. Meditation increases our immune response. The, the study uh, I read described uh, an eight-week course for people that had no experience meditating, and they were compared to a group that were trained in cognitive behavioral therapy techniques for the same time period, both lar you know, involving a lot of thinking, cognition, uh, and then both groups, after, after the study was completed, were given a flu vaccine. The, the antibodies were rated for both groups, and it was found that the meditators had 40% greater immune response than the non-meditators. So I, that's profound. Why are we not meditating more? <laughs> um, the last point I've alluded to a couple, couple times already, and that is children can be taught emotional management to become better learners, less disruptive in schools, and become better adults. The whole research of the ACEs shows that um, 
that people with traumatic backgrounds who go into school have problems. We can intervene in earlier years and much earlier and much more systematically and broadly than we do right now. These programs should be in every school. Why not? It will make a teacher's life easier. So this is Matthew Ricard. He's another uh, Tibetan Lama who was studied uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. This came out of, I think it was Esquire magazine. He, he was called the world's happiest man because um, the gamma waves that were measured while he was meditating on compassion were off the charts. It was the highest ever achieved. On the bell curves I showed you, he was at the very end. And even the other meditators were not uh, as accomplished in, in keeping that, that level of compassion and positivity going. So that's pretty amazing. It's, it's what's possible for a human being to do. Here's his life lessons. And these have some cognitive behavioral skills in here, so I'm going to go over these a minute. Happiness is not the pursuit of endless succession of experiences. It's a way of being. It's a skill. Like learning to swim or ride a bike or read, it takes practice and repetition, and then you get better at it. To be truly happy, we have to get rid of the mental toxins such as hatred, obsession, arrogance, envy, greed, and pride. These are all Buddhist terms that apply to Western psychology as well. Um, cultivating positive qualities such as altruism actually inhibits the negative qualities that I just read. In our, in our culture right now, this is a, quite a challenge if you pay attention to the news. The way the mind interprets the world is a crucial element in determining the quality of every instant that goes by. We must learn to recognize that there are mental states or emotions that are conducive to flourishing and others that are, are destructive. He calls it antidote training. It's also referred to as reciprocal, reciprocal inhibition, and it, it's another um, Tibetan Buddhist strategy for, for helping, helping with emotions and emotional um, difficulties. One of the discoveries uh, of the mind-life studies and the research is there's a refractory period, and they can actually see it in the graphs on the uh, MRI, the functional MRIs where there is an instant where um, stimulation occurs in the brain and there's no interpretation of it. And then the next instant it is interpreted and, and we understand it and do something with it in our brains. The first instant allows the opportunity to intervene with uh, uh, emotional management uh, techniques. Antidote training. Uh, another technique for CBT is just to pay attention to anger and stay focused on it. And the same as if you eat sweets constantly, you know, over and over, you lose attraction to sweets. Uh, I think our, our, our sweet taste sensing mechanism is flooded, essentially. And the same would be true they're, they believe with anger, if we really pay attention to it in a sustained way, it starts to vanish. It doesn't mean understand why, it just means looking at the emotion itself. And that's a subtle difference. He says everyone would be helped by meditating for half an hour a day. I think that's true. And that's what I tried to show. Uh, we are self-organizing systems. If uh, we adjust to alcohol or opiates or anything that enters our body, then we organize around that and that becomes part of our functioning in order to return to a normal homeostasis. We need to change that, anyone who does it. So that's, that's all I had to say for now. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. I appreciate your... Um 
my question would be, because we know that childhood trauma is so important when a child enters the learning experience in school, okay, is are they trained, the school psychologists, social workers, to do a, a regular inventory for every student that comes through? Is that is that happening? Do you know? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. know. I'm not I'm in the, the school, school districts. districts. I, um, when I worked for the county, I went um, to a lot of different Mendocino County schools to evaluate kids. So I was doing what you're describing. I was going into the classroom to, to do that. But it wasn't for everyone. It was really the um, high risk, uh, severely emotionally disturbed kids that, that were targeted. And um, to the best of my knowledge, they don't have any of these, the kinds of programs that are, have come out of this research um, going on, but they might. I doubt if it's, um, it's covering everyone in the school, maybe one or two teachers. If I would have been rated coming out of my dysfunctional family, I would have been right up there and somebody could have intervened, but that never happened. Of course, that's a long time ago. It never happened in my life either. Uh, I didn't know about counseling until I got into college. And I, I'm sure it would have made things much better. Yeah, I'm high, I'm high on the ACEs scores. Most of the people in graduate school and undergraduate school in psychology are. <laughs> Social work, yep. I mean, we have an inborn interest in that if, we have, if we've had childhood experiences to cause that interest. Yeah, there's a, pa a PASS program, P-A-T-H, that, um, that was mentioned in one of the uh, Mind and Life uh, lectures that I heard. And uh, it was 80% reduction in suspensions huge increase in, in grade point average, uh, a decrease in abs absenteeism. And from what I hear and what I've read, um, every type of that program that's developed, there are many right now around the country, have similar successful stories. It just takes a little bit of effort and probably some money to get teachers trained and I think we'd, we'd make our, our society a better place. I mean, why not do that and save some lives rather than have shootings in school? Those are all emotional hair trigger responses that the emotions are not being managed responsibly or effectively and the results are horrific. So, yeah. Since there seems to be uh a lack of altruism in our country today because of what's going on. How, uh, what is the teaching about dealing with looking at basically, in my opinion, the chaos that's going on and formulating a different way of interpreting that so you don't get down about what's going on in this country and you can maintain your own happiness? I can only answer personally. Uh, if I read the news, I get angry and depressed and upset and shocking. And um, you know, and then I meditate or I go do something that's more pleasurable to, you know, balance that out. There's a lot of great trails up in, in Brook Trails. I go for walks a lot and listen to the brooks, the streams, or you know. Create some positive um, experiences. It's a good CBT technique. Yeah. Paul, can you give an, an example, like in a session, how you would work with somebody, for instance, with like anger management issues that have that kind of a pattern? What that would look like in a session? First, um, when I'm in a counseling session, I'm, I'm paying full attention. So I observe whatever's happening. My observing self is at high alert. And um, while doing that, I gather information about their background, why they're there, why they came in to talk with me. Uh, everyone's background has a, a wealth of information. 
the, a great tool is to write an autobiography, you know, and, uh, you know, check it out. You can learn something just by what you write about yourself. Then, um, based on what I, I discover and if there is, and I find there's anger problems and if that's what they came in for, then I teach some um, cognitive behavioral tools, skills. Um, uh, one is um, learning to recognize, well, the first one I, I guess would be to leave the situation that's causing them anger so they can reduce that emotional flooding. Uh, the second would be to recognize where the cue is. What is the stimulus that's causing that kind of reaction? Uh, then, in addition, I mean, this isn't, you know, it's not really sequentially like I'm describing, but um, uh, some of the skills that, were, that I mentioned in, in, in this talk about mindfulness, and um, another is uh, breathing meditation. People need to learn s better and effective self-soothing and calming techniques. Um, John Kabat-Zinn uh, is a, a psychologist at uh, University of Massachusetts that, that utilized meditation, yoga, relaxation techniques in pain management. Uh, his program was highly successful. It's still being used all over the place. So some of the some of those tools I've I've used with anger management. And the last tool that's most important is communication. People that get angry uh, generally. Uh, really enraged, blame others for how they feel. They use uh, foul language, name calling, and that just heightens all the emotions in the situation even more. So learning some communication skills about better ways to express that are necessary. I have a story. <laughs> Once upon a time, it's a story for little kids, so you can pretend you're a little kid. Once upon a time, there was a little turtle. Turtle with a shell. A terrapin. And the, the turtle liked to play with himself and find things to do that were enjoyable. And he also liked to play with his friends and other little, little kids. And then he started school. He did not like school. He kept getting in trouble. His teacher yelled at him. Other kids yelled at him. He had a great deal of difficulty and became upset very easily. So this little turtle uh, was wandering around after school. And on the edge of the of the uh, town where he lived, he ran into an old, old 300-year-old turtle who lived on the outskirts. And it was pretty obvious uh, to the old turtle, just looking at this little guy, to see what, that he had something wrong, what's going on. And the little turtle told, told the older one what was happening and uh, at school and and he asked, what can I do? What can I do to change this? So the old turtle told him, the answer is on your back. All you do is go inside your shell. So the, the little turtle tried, and the older turtle told him the three things to do inside his shell. Stop, breathe, figure out what's wrong, and then if you can think of a, pro a, a productive way to handle it, come out. So they practiced over and over, and the little turtle got very good at it and couldn't wait to go to school the next day. He went there went back to his classroom, had fun at recess, 
But right when he came back in, some kids started teasing him. This was a pattern. But instead of doing what he used to do, the little turtle went into his shell. He started breathing, calming down, stopping himself, and then wondered what he could do and came out when he figured out a solution. The first thing he saw was his teacher smiling at him. From then on, that was the positive reinforcement that allowed him to continue with that technique, which is a cognitive behavioral skill of mindfulness and uh, affect management, emotional management. He kept practicing at school and got better and better with the help of his teacher. Then he liked school. He did well. He succeeded. <laughs> The end. <laughs> it's, a, it's a simple little story, but it has all these little elements that are consistent with um, mindfulness training and um, emotional management that is completely lacking in our school systems. The, I know many teachers Every one of them complains to me about how difficult it is to teach. 80% of the time, I'm told, over and over again, is taken to manage their classroom behaviors. And it seems like a, a really no-brainer to try and institute some of these, these techniques into the classrooms. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.